<laughs> from uh, Good Morning Football on Fox Sports as well, Peter Schrager. How are you, Peter? Don't be a goner, Rich, all right? We don't, don't want to give any uh, Kinaharas here. We're going to talk Yiddish. Let's do it, my friend. Well, I mean, you know, uh, the Saints gone if to win last night, one would say. That means stealing. You don't want to be a thief. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> so, uh, what do you think? I mean, because I'm having my fun here. Brockman, the uh, the Patriot uh, honk and uh, hater of anybody else, um, <laughs> uh, thinks that Breeze is toast. Breeze is toast. Um, what, what's your two cents on this subject? Well, look, I think the Peacock thing was fitting because a lot of people were tweeting out visuals of the Peacock logo yesterday, the way Breeze was playing in the first half, that maybe it's time (laughs) for him to get in the booth before uh, we finish the season up. The truth of the matter is the storyline would be so much different if Breeze didn't save the day last night. We know that the Chargers muff things up with the kicks, and that's just going to happen, but... They're down 20-3, to three, and everyone on Twitter is demanding Jameis Winston. And Rich Breeze went 21-26 uh, from the second half on and was lights out when they needed him. So, again, I-, I thought this was really impressive from the Saints, even though everyone's going to just point to the Chargers muffing this game. This could have been a totally different conversation this morning if they're sitting at 2-3, and three, and Michael Thomas hasn't played in three weeks because he's punching out teammates. Instead, they're in first place, and they're headed towards the bye. Yeah, well, what's the deal with Michael Thomas? Because Peyton didn't make any commitments that you're going to see him in a Saints uniform after the bye. What's the scoop with him, best you can tell? You no, know, and, and uh, shows a lot of gumption, and kind of I was impressed with Peyton's decision that despite all the injuries and the must-win, that stuck by his guns, didn't play Thomas. The story that I heard, and this comes secondhand, is that in practice, now they had their helmets on, there was a punch thrown at uh, Gardner, or Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, the second-year corner, and that it, was, it went beyond the usual just competitive spirit, and it carried on and on, and and Peyton made a decision, so it's not gonna it's not gonna happen here. We're not gonna do it this year. We've been through too much of the team the last few years and through too much over the last four months, having been in quarantine all of August together in a hotel. We're not gonna have people punching each other at practice. And he's put him on ice for last week, but like you said, there's no guarantee he's coming back anytime soon, injury or not. And I think it's a fascinating storyline, especially if they can win games without Michael Thomas on the field. Peter Schrager here on the Rich Eisen Show. Um, And, you know, feel-good stories are just amazing in the NFL. And obviously Alex Smith is one of them uh, to see him back on the field. Um, And just for inspiration for, uh, for, for Dak, one would say, not just Alex Smith, but also in this division, uh, Teddy Bridgewater. I mean, how how for real do you think the Panthers can be? We had Matt Rule on yesterday. They're three and zero without Christian McCaffrey. Bridgewater is dealing in this system uh, in a way that obviously Rule and Joe Brady thought he could. What do you think about Carolina in this division? I mean, are they not the quietest, most impressive team that no one's talking about? I love that you're even asking me about them. Three straight wins without McCaffrey on the field. And their defense, everyone had major questions because they start all these rookies. They start about five rookies. Their draft this year, they only drafted defensive players, seven players taken in the draft, all defensive players. And the first week, the Raiders came in and lit them up in their building. And then somehow Phil Snow, who is a 60-year-old defensive coordinator, this is his first year as defensive coordinator in the NFL, is finding a way to mix it up and get these guys to play football. We love the Bridgewater story, and we love the Robbie Anderson story because, of course, Matt Rule was his college coach, and these guys have this great relationship. But I think the defense is the story. Guys like Brian Burns and Jeremy Chin, a lot of people have not seen these Panthers wins because, let's be quite honest, they're usually in the eighth market game from Fox at 1 o'clock in the afternoon when there's a lot bigger teams being played. Guess what? Three straight wins, and they're doing it with good defense, too. And I think that's the biggest surprise around the league. Everyone thought they were going to be able to generate points with Brady and, of course, with Bridgewater and all the weapons they had. But I don't think anyone thought they'd be able to play some defense, especially this year, and they have. So they're a team to deal with. They're really difficult to get out of. And I think with Matt Rule, these guys are believing they're a young team, and they're playing for their coach. Do you think there's another team that was out there that could have had Matt Rule and Robbie Anderson hooked up um, together with a young team with a huge upside? Is there another team in the NFL that had that opportunity, you know, Peter? Rich, I'm in New up? York, and I'll be quite honest. Like I've got relationships within that Jets franchise. <laughs> and a couple years ago when they were doing the coaching search, yeah. it was almost like they, they gave Rule the interview as <sighs> – all right, let's just give Matt Rule in here because he interviewed for Indianapolis last year and we hear great things. And 
They interviewed Kingsbury and Rule, and they let both those guys walk out the building, and they rushed to hire Adam Gase, and that's the truth of it. Like, Kingsbury got on a private jet after meeting with the uh, brass with New York and flew to Arizona and was the head coach of the Cardinals by the end of the next day. What could have been? Who knows? Because Kingsbury came in there this week and took care of business, and Matt Rule is 3-2 and two with a very young team down there in Carolina. So now um, that's, I guess, my way, Peter Schrager, of turning the subject matter to coach coaching with the Falcons blowing out their entire building with the exception, I guess, of Rich McKay. And then uh, we saw what Houston did blowing out the, the dual uh, rolled Bill O'Brien. Who, who's next? I mean, is it the Jets? Who, who, who might be next here, if, if at all? What do you yeah, think? Yeah, this is obviously – this and COVID reports is not the fun part of no. the job that I have and that we work in. Um, but I think all eyes are on the Jets. We'll see how far this thing goes. The bye week's in November, but at this point, you're 0-5. You've seen two other teams already get a head start on the head coaching search. The issue with the Jets, and this is not like a thing you rally around – Who's the coach if you fire him? That's the thing. Is it Jim Bob Cooter? Is it Dowell Loggins? Do you go down a Greg Williams era now with the Jets to finish the season? I think what they really want to see there is how Darnold returns after injury and what we can see out of Darnold because if you do have a number one overall pick or a number two overall pick, just not in the nature of the game, if you have a pick that high, you have to at least consider the quarterback position, and it's a quarterback-rich draft. So if Gase gives Darnold – the best opportunity to succeed, well, then do you really want to can Gase midway through? But I would look at that bye week and just do a check-in, but I don't think we're going to have any action in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and this is the reason why I bring it up, Peter, is obviously, you know, Jets are near and dear to my heart, but also, you know, it's a national story because if the Jets are do wind up with the number one overall selection, um, their decision what to do with it in relation to Darnold is a monster story, certainly if the number one overall pick is up for grabs a la Ricky Williams type trade with Mike Ditka yeah. you know what I mean uh, even though the Jets already do have truce first round selections over the next two years thanks to cashing in Jamal Adams before the season which did nothing to help with the evaluation of Darnold which is I guess my point here is how do the Jets not know at this point either the kids worth it or not I mean like we you know what I mean like you know what I mean they they know they know the stuff of which he's made mentally and also heart you know that he's aces on that front he checks every box as a face front individual for the franchise the question is, is obviously, what, what can he do on the field? They don't have the pieces around. I mean, this kid Smith is a pretty good wide receiver. Uh, Becton is a large human being who we know is going to protect whoever's behind him. Le'Veon Bell's liking tweets on Twitter that, cat, that, that, that carp on the coach. I mean, honestly, what's to evaluate with Darnold from what you're hearing right now? Well, the question is, if you have someone like a Trevor Lawrence, what gives you a better opportunity to win in the coming years? It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a knock on Darnold if they took Lawrence. It would be, okay, well, we've got given this three and a half years, and now we're entering year number four, and we haven't really seen the full potential. And you could say, I don't care if it's Trevor Lawrence or if it's Tom Brady or if it's Patrick Mahomes, they're not winning with Jeff Smith and Braxton Berrios at number one and number two <laughs> wide receiver. That said, if Trevor Lawrence comes up in a draft, you don't get that every generation either. So I say generation, every year we go to the generation, this is a quarterback of the generation, but you know what I mean. You don't, you don't hope to have the one or two pick every so often. So that's the issue with Darnold. Like, at four years in, are you still feeling like you can still win a Super Bowl with Sam Darnold? Again, nothing against the kid, but it might just be time to turn the page if they find that's the determination at the end of this thing. Look, this is a very tough year for him. He's been injured. He's been knocked around. And quite frankly, I don't think he has the tools around him. I don't think the coaching or necessarily the skill position players are as good as other teams and other young quarterbacks have. But at some point, do you go down this road or do you, do you say, okay, let's at least just start anew with a whole new group of people, faces both on the coaching staff and at the quarterback position. Peter Schrager, good morning football of NFL Network, Fox Sports, here on the Rich Eisen Show. Let's get to uh, the AFC. Tonight we see the Bills and the Titans because – uh, COVID tests came back clear, thank goodness. So this game is going to be played this evening. And I think the Bills have the best shot in the AFC to dethrone the Chiefs. And I said that before I watched the Raiders uh, perform like they did in Arrowhead. What do you say about the AFC? Uh, do we see the, the best team tonight that wins has the best chance to dethrone the Chiefs? Or it could be somebody else, Peter? And the nuance of this game is interesting because we'll see how both these teams handle what they've been through. I mean, 
the Titans, for example, have had maybe two practices over the last ten days, and that's not certainly anything you want. But I think the Bills – thinking they have a game on Sunday, then they have a game on Tuesday, and I speak to guys in that organization, as of 24 hours ago, they're like, we're not sure we're playing tomorrow night. Like, this is all adversity, and it's not a tragedy, like a death or anything right. in, the, in the facility, but what it is, is it is this kind of deal where, all right, it's going to be a long season, we're going to deal with bumps in the road, we're a young team, how are we going to handle this? So, I'm curious if the Bills pick up right where they left off against the Raiders, where they looked awesome on the road, and Josh Norman's making plays, and the defense is stuffing the same Raiders team that just lit up the Chiefs. If Buffalo can take care of business in Tennessee and put up points and do all the things that they've been doing, I think they absolutely have to be in the conversation for the AFC Championship game. And they absolutely could be on the same field as the Chiefs, which the last two weeks have not exactly been lighting it up. And, of course, there is the undefeated Steelers that's sitting out there as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, my next guest after you and our number two is Chase Claypool, who I know you oh. spoke about at length on Good Morning Football today for those uh, who may have just heard of him for the first time because he scored four times and they've already put in a waiver claim for him tonight uh, in their fantasy <laughs> league. Tell, tell everybody a little bit more about this Canadian football player yeah. here. What do you got for me? Well, well, in the NBC theme of things, he was a star at Notre Dame for like one year, but his story to get there was really cool. He put on one of those videos on Facebook of – of himself doing plays when he was out in Abbotsford, British Columbia. A bunch of teams saw the video. A recruiter from Notre Dame came calling, and this is a true story, and Tariko last year detailed it well in one of the games. Notre Dame sends a recruiting letter, and he goes to his coach in Canada and says, is Notre Dame good at football? So that is how little he knew about American football. Like, is Notre Dame good at football? Didn't even know. Ends up going to Notre Dame. Has this great year. And I think he slipped in the draft because, Rich, we were at the Combine. He looked the part. He ran the part. And everyone I spoke to was like, this kid's great. Great personality. Brings it every day. And certainly is one of these guys you want as a face of a franchise. Steelers take him. They get him. And they put him in the system. They didn't even work him out. They didn't even do a pro day with him because of the whole coronavirus situation. So they get him in the 40s and already – he has four touchdowns in a game. He's the he's the last he's the first rookie to do that since Reggie Bush did it in his rookie year, which was great. And I think he's the first wide receiver to do it. I don't even have the guy who did it since 1979. So historic stuff. But a Canadian-born player who really did not have much familiarity with American football, and here we are, fat five, four or five years later, he's already one of the household names on your fantasy team. Right, and and, and I think again the reason why 1979 became such a uh, and it's interesting that Pittsburgh is mentioned in 1979 since that was, that was the We Are Family year as well. I'm dating myself, but um, no, it's the first. Stargell, th I'm in. Let's go. I know that's the last time the Steelers started 4-0 was 1979 as well. So are you saying to me that Chase Claypool? Um, by asking the person who's recruiting him, is Notre Dame good at football, means he never saw the movie Rudy. Is that, <laughs> oh. what, is that what that means? Can we glean that, that he never saw Rudy if he asked a question like that? Never saw Rudy, doesn't know who Rick Meyer is, didn't go with Bino Cook and pick Ron Palace to win back-to-back -back Heisman. He's got no knowledge of any of it. Someone needs to beef him up on his Notre Dame knowledge. I, I, I like the kid. With each passing fact, I learn about him. To, honestly, great I kid. I can't wait to hear the interview. I can't wait to chat with him. <laughs> I can't wait to chat with him. Four touchdowns as a wide receiver. Wow. Amazing. Since night that hasn't been done since 1979, huh? So, um, okay, uh, who's the best team in the NFC then through five weeks? What do you got for me? I think the Packers. I know there's a lot of Seahawks fans who are listening in and saying, now wait a second, just the Packers have been complete dominance, and they've done it without Devontae Adams the last few weeks. So, you know, they're on the bye week, not top of mind right now, but – you see that smile. It's not even a smile. I mean, it's, it's like a it's a glint in the eye or a smirk from Rogers, and it's like terrifying. I just think he's in one of these zones that it's he's he's just unconscious right now, and he's like talking with such zen like peace of mind and spirit. And these players are loving him this year. There's no drama. The coach and him are getting along great, and the defense is doing the job. So again, not the, the we're not fresh off an amazing fourth quarter comeback that Russell Wilson just had, and certainly not some of the fan bases that are fired up by wins from this past weekend. But the Packers, to me, have been wire to wire the best team in the NFC. So you've got them right there, and then the Seahawks. I mean, how great. Uh, the, the, <laughs> name me another team that plays more wild edge-of-seat games. I, I, I think they play games that's kind of like 
suits Pete Carroll's personality. Like, it, you know, like I, I'm sitting there hopping up and down and chomping on gum, too, watching every down of this. They, they play games that, that, that fits their coach's personality from competing to just being wild and bouncing off the walls. It's amazing. Yeah. You know? Last year's Week 17 game that they ended up losing, actually, to the 49ers, I would argue is one of the best games we've right. seen in the last five years. It's never mentioned. It was so intense to the very last play where Greenlaw stops the guy. I think it was uh, uh, the twin who used to play for the, uh, the Patriots, the tight end. He tackles him, stops him on the one. And it's like, this is every game this year. This is what they're doing. The Seahawks find a way. And that drive, I said it on Monday's show, I think it's the best drive of the season, and it's going to be the best drive of the season. 94 yards in two minutes, and it's the full Russell Wilson experience. You get on a fourth and ten where everyone's clobbering Brady last week for not just taking the first down and trying to go for it all. And Russell Wilson throws it 30 yards on the sideline of DK Metcalf. He does one of those pirouette plays on second down. And then, of course, Metcalf drops the pass earlier in the drive and then gets the fourth and goal incredible touchdown. But, like, I just never feel like the game is over. That one was, I believe, you know, they were shut out 17 or 13 nothing in the first half and, you know, goes to halftime and we're getting Tony Dungy and the boys and NBC. And I'm like, this game's not over. Like, we have to watch the whole thing. And, of course, you watch the Lakers celebration, you flip it back over, and it's 21-13, they're winning. Like, that's just what they do. And I think you're right. Like, he is unbelievable right now. It's going to be him and Rodgers, I think, wire to wire here in this this. MVP race. If Josh Allen might throw his hat in the ring, Mahomes, of course, but this feels like Rodgers and Wilson, who have been great rivals the last 10 years. I feel like they're on a crash course for each other again. Peter Schrager, thank you for the time. Uh, as I was texting back and forth with you over the weekend, um, or I think maybe even during game day morning when, when, yeah. I, when I booked you, um, that uh, you know Aikman giving a pop to Good Morning Football during Thursday night saying that he doesn't miss the show. He watches it every day. It's just great to hear, man. I already, t- I always told you I'd tell it to you and Kay and Nate and, um, you know, obviously uh, Kyle, who's on tomorrow, and he's been on every Wednesday, um, that uh, I always thought at some point when I was hosting NFL Total Access from 03 to 2011, losing all my remaining hair during that lockout year, that at some point there would have to be another tent pole show on the network, and, and then your show was born. So congrats on everything. Back. That's that's awesome to hear, and I will tell you that you set the bar so high for us uh, on Sundays and on the face of our network, and we're happy to work under that umbrella. So we appreciate it, my man. Right back at you, Peter. We'll chat soon. Thanks for the call. Yep. You got it. That's Peter Schrager right here on the Rich Eisen Show. At P. Schrager's. At P. Schrager's to follow him. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here. 